First, we have Ms. Joan London, the former host of Good Morning America. Next, we will have Ms. Kate Mee Rolai, the Director of Work Equ Equity at the National Employment Law Project. Ms. Sharon Tremaine is the Director of Work and Family Program and Senior Staff Attorney of Legal Aid at Work in California. Next, we will welcome Ms. Rebecca Hamilton, who is the co-CEO of the W.S. Badger Company. Next, we have Ms. Vicki Chabot, a senior fellow for paid leave policy and strategy at the Better Life Lab. And finally, we will hear from Ms. Hadley Heath Manning, the Director of Policy at the Independent Women's Forum. Each of your statements will be made part of the record in their entirety. I would ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes or less. And to help with that time, there is a timing light at your table. When you have one minute left, the light will switch from green to yellow, and then finally proceed to red when the five minutes are up. Ms. London, you are recognized. Good morning, Chairman Neal and Ranking Member Brady and everyone on this committee. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today on behalf of the Family and Medical Insurance Leave Act. Uh, my name is Joan London. I am a journalist. I am also a women and family and caregiving advocate. I'm also a wife and mother to seven children, and I was the caregiver to my late mother who suffered from dementia and to my late brother who suffered from the many complications of type 2 diabetes. So I'm also part of the sandwich generation, caring for children at the same time as caring for aging parents and ailing um, siblings, all while working full time. For me, the juggling act of being a working mom began in 1980 when I became host of Good Morning America just seven weeks after having my first child. But I was fortunate. I worked for a company, ABC TV, that not only gave me time off when each of my daughters was born, but when I returned to work, I was privileged to be one of the first working women in the country to be allowed to bring my infant daughter to work with me. Those perks were unheard of at the time, but I then started getting boxes of mail from women all over the country saying, we need help like that, but we don't have access to any kind of benefits. Perhaps it was having the good fortune of being in that wonderful position that kind of lit the fire in me to embark on a path as a women and family advocate. Of course, things have changed a lot since 1980. The Family and Medical Leave Act was passed, but that is unpaid leave and doesn't really cover caregiving for everyone. Some states, as we've heard, have passed their own comprehensive paid leave policies, and more companies are now offering paid leave to employees. But as I understand it, fewer than half of American workers currently have access to that kind of employer-provided paid leave. Statistics show us that one in four moms in this country returns to work just 10 days after childbirth, even though all the research tells us that time off after giving birth results in improved health for babies and parents, both physically and mentally. Our world is quite different today, I think, than the world that we all grew up in where extended families live close together and we're there for each other in the time of need. Today's world is a mobile one. Families are dispersed. Young people often move far away from home to find work. And that leaves both older parents and young growing families far apart when a crisis hits. According to the Department of Health and Human Services, about half of Americans turning 65 today will develop some kind of a disability that is serious enough that they will require care. What that means is that the number of American workers who will need personal medical leave, either for themselves or for another family member, is only going to increase. We are in the middle of a caregiving crisis, and that is why I so strongly believe that any paid leave policy should address the full range of caregiving needs that families will face. I think it's fair to say that all of us, at some point or another, will have to give or receive care. And let's face it, there's never a good time for a health crisis, 
whether it's emergency back surgery or tending to an aging parent, or in my case, having treatment for cancer. I will tell you that when you hear those words, you have cancer, you are paralyzed. You know your life is in the balance and you have to attend to your medical attention, but you don't want to lose work. I think people want to work. They want to pay their bills, but far too many are ending up in debt. They shouldn't lose their jobs or their homes in many cases simply because they want to have a baby or care for a family member in need. We need to support families and we need to keep people engaged in our workforce. And paid family and medical leave will support families and employers because they won't have to lose workers when life happens. In the end, not having to make that choice between income and caring for a loved one, I think it will make us all stronger, both at work and at home. And families everywhere are counting on all of you, Congress, to adopt this kind of comprehensive paid leave that will help all of us when we need it the most. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. London. Let me recognize. Uh, Ms. London, thank you for being here today. You testified that ABC was willing to give you paid leave and other support you needed to balance your work and your family, and that helped you advance your career. But you also point out that you've heard often from viewers whose experience were very different. Could you tell us? more about some of those stories. You know, back then there wasn't uh, uh, Facebook or email, so it was boxes and boxes and boxes that just kept coming in from women all across the country that said, you know, this is a step in the right direction and, you, and it's something that's visible so that employers see it. But we all need help and we, what are we supposed to do? And here we are, I think that's 40 years later, and we're really still asking that question, what are they all supposed to do? And these days I hear from people literally day in and day out, whether, I mean, just the other day I heard from a couple and she got late stage cancer, she had to quit her job, but the husband was the only one around to take care of her. He had to leave, he lost his job because he spent so much time with her and now they're losing their home. Uh, and they're in what's called medical bankruptcy. Um, I hear these stories all the time, whether it's you know a, a young mother trying to have a child, or really more often today I hear about it, whether it's a daughter, a granddaughter, or whoever taking care of an older parent who's aging, who, and they're the only ones around. And often they don't even tell their employer that they're taking on, that they're staying up all night you know, with a sick parent and then coming into work during the day, that employer thinks they're just not focused or they don't care enough, but they're afraid to even say anything because they're afraid they'll be passed over for a promotion, for a, a raise. Um, I mean, we're in a terrible situation. The only thing I really worry about is that if we kind of kick the can down the road, these people that we're really talking about, not people who work for big companies with great paid leave programs, or in states, you know, that have a, a comprehensive program. But these people that we're talking about, they're the ones that are going to absolutely depend on that social security when they get there. I hear all the time that what they're doing, quite often boomers like me, are taking out of their own retirement savings in order to care for parents who are in their 90s that never expected to live that long and didn't provide for themselves. So that is, I think just exacerbating the problem, which is why we've got to somehow help the families now when they need it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bolt, I've been very... Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank all of our witnesses. And Ms. London, I, I want to thank you for your incredible career. We, being a baby boomer, a lot of us here, we've watched you over the years. So thank you so much for especially this effort, but all, all the other things you've done. You mentioned, you've made a point that uh, it's 10 days uh, the average woman, is that what you said? She has a baby and she's back to work in 10 days? One in four women in the country come back to work just 10 days after childbirth. Um, I just can't even imagine that. I mean, and especially if you have a cesarean, the idea that you're going to go back to work in 10 days because of absolute financial necessity 
it's, it's more than unheard of. It's no woman should be doing that. And an employer, I mean, then what do they think of that employee who's, you know, they're going to think that they're unfocused, that they don't really care about their job. It, it's just really unfathomable that we have women going back to work that soon because they just can't afford not to. Yeah, I, I, let me, I, that was pretty incredible, but I, I didn't know what that time frame is. But I just think back, you were talking about before, and, you know, I grew up one of six kids, the oldest of six, uh, in eight years. And my dad worked two jobs. My mom stayed at home. My dad worked in the factory. My mom went back to the factory after all the kids were in school. But that was kind of what happened in our neighborhood, our communities back then. But everything's changed. Now there's more women in the workforce. So we all agree, I think, on both sides of the aisle. This is something we can do, I think, on a bipartisan basis. We've got to find a way to come together to be able to deal with that. The other Thank thing the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Kelly, to inquire. I thank the chairman. Thank you all for being here. Ms. Lund, I can't tell you the number of times I've watched you on TV. So after mass in the morning, I'd be going to work and I'd go in and put it on the waiting room and, uh, and watching our customers enjoyed watching that. The reason I say in our waiting room, I'm an automobile dealer. Uh, so I want to thank all of our panelists today. Uh, both panels, I thought, were informative. Would have loved to have seen men on those panels <laughs> and not all women. But I think that um, what I hope your takeaway will be um, is that all of us care about this issue. We have to figure out a solution that makes sense for everyone. Uh, for me, I, I want to make sure that um, a paid family leave is truly comprehensive. We talked about um, the definition of family and making sure that that's, in, um, that that's inclusive. Uh, for me, I, I don't have children, but I have uh, elderly parents, and I, I saw my whole world kind of change when my dad had a massive stroke uh, 14 years ago. He lived for 10 years uh, after that massive stroke, uh, but it, it, it really upended our whole family and affected everyone in our family in different ways. My mom retired early. She gave up a job that she loved. Um, she also gave up being on the city council in Selma after many, many years, um, and it just changed our whole dynamic. And what was clear to me that while money, sending money home when I was in New York City helped, what they needed was a whole family approach to making sure that our family survived uh, the stroke. And I'm blessed to say that I moved back home to Alabama, not to run for Congress, but to, to uh, help take care of my dad. Um, but I can tell you that making sure that the definition of what we talk about in terms of family leave is truly comprehensive. Yes, we care about that parent and that new mom and dad, but we also want to make sure that we're taking care of uh, the whole family. Um, uh, Joan, we've watched you on television. You talk about the sandwich or panini <laughs> situation that you're in. Can you talk a little bit more about why it's important that we make sure that we're being comprehensive uh, in our approach to family paid leave. Well, I want to make sure that we do address the caregiving needs because if you look at our population, we heard earlier that we are having fewer births, um, but we are having increasing needs for caregivers. We are told that by 2030, there will be far more people over 65 than there will be under 18 years of age. And the nature of that population is also changing in, in that there are many, many women um, who live longer uh, and are alone and, and are in poverty. So the idea of taking away anything from the so, their social security really frightens me because I feel like it's just kicking the problem to a, to a, a later time. Absolutely. So, um, and I kind of came to this whole space uh, organically because I took care of my mom and my brother and made every mistake along the way <laughs> and said people need to be better prepared and just decided I was a conduit, so started speaking in it. But the more I learn about it and the more I hear from people, I hear from a lot of people that are in that boomer generation and now much, much younger who are either dipping into their own retirement savings mm -hmm or are not putting away Enough retirement money. savings that they would have done 
but they have to use them for parents who are living into their late 80s and 90s who have never expected to live that long. I wonder, and, Ms. London, if you might comment. The, the, you, you mentioned in your testimony the thousands of letters that you received back when people wrote letters, I suppose. Yes. It's all email or something else now. That's a pretty interesting focus group. I would suspect, and just maybe have you comment on this, whether the people who were feeling that stress uh, were experiencing more stress in their life as a result of not being able to have access to medical leave or less stress. And what do we know about the effect that stress has on health, on productivity, on other things that have an economic impact? Well, from reading those letters and now more recently from reading Facebook posts constantly and people just coming into me at, on my website, I mean, they're completely stressed out. Now, I must say, I'm also a small business owner, and I usually have anywhere from two to three one-time employees. And I feel so inadequate hearing what Badger is doing. But it's, it's impractical. Um, and I struggle with this all the time. I mean, I had an employee leave, and I was doing maternity leave pay. But I had to go and hire another person to replace her. And the economics, I can't just miraculously make what I'm earning go up to compensate for that. And I really contemplated whether I should even keep my production company opening, open and working on projects like this. But they're meaningful to me, and I want to do something. I want to continue working and try to make a difference. Um, but it's very, very difficult when you have co a company as small as I do. So as I listened to all this, the idea of putting the onus on an employer, and I don't think, I think there are many, many companies that are small like me, under 10, under five people. It's just, un, it's impractical to think that we can carry that burden, but I would be willing to pay as an employer, and I think my employees would too. Of course, they're all women. They're all young women, all having children, and if, if we had the option to do that so that I had the comfort <coughs> in knowing that my employees were gonna be taken care of, I would be ecstatic over that. Because I always feel bad not being able to lay out the kinds of things that your company that has, I don't know, 100 employees can do. It's, it's no can do when you have two, three, four employees. Thank you so much. My time's expired. I, I think the chair. Ms. Lund, you also, could you comment on, from a small business perspective, um, what it would mean in terms of a national program? Well, having been a, a women's and family advocate, I, of course, would like to be able to have a, an ambitious, comprehensive paid leave a, a policy in place for my business, but it's the economics involved. But the people I hear from all the time, uh, they're in the middle to lower income. Many of them don't work for big companies that have paid leave, and so you know, it's only those states that have enacted some kind of a policy, and if you don't live in that state, you're not in that zip code, they really uh, many, many times don't have another family member just because of, by virtue of how we are all living in the world today, and they don't have that support. They don't have the, the help, and so I hear from them all the time that they are struggling, fi struggling financially, and all too often something we need to point out caregivers are known to have many, many more health problems, and they are, statistically, they don't have the longevity that the other people who are not caregivers have. So we have to worry about all of the health issues, and health issues bring with them health costs. So I think that we're kind of getting into the root, finally, of the problem here, that's what you're doing instead of just putting Band-Aids on things. You're getting to the root of the problem that is, in my opinion, this is going to bring down health costs in America. I don't have all the statistics that the experts here on the panel here have, but I hear from people all the time, mostly women, um, that they don't take care of their own health because they're so focused on taking care of the health of older relatives, and they end up you know, not catching cancer soon enough when it can be easily treated as opposed to when it's in stage four. So you, you really have to look at all the kind of the fingers that reach out that affect uh, the psyche of people today, the embarrassment 
that they don't want to go to their employer and say, I've got to take care of an aging parent or a sick sibling. So there's a lot more involved here than actually just the cost. And again, as a worker or an employer, I would like to buy that insurance policy at a, a reasonable cost to make sure that if something happens along the way, that I'll have coverage. That's kind of the way I look at it, is buying that insurance policy. I, I would also like to add one other. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Swazi, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for bringing this important issue to all of us. I want to thank all of the panelists who are here today. We really appreciate the fact that you took a lot of time to prepare for this and to come down here and to spend all these hours here. Uh, we're very grateful to you for your help with this. Uh, I think we first would start that we all recognize, all, all of the witnesses, there's a problem in America, right? Does everybody agree with that? Ms. London, Ms. Rowley, problem in this country? I don't think you'd find a woman in this country that would disagree with that. So would you agree with that, Ms. May? And the other three of you, are there any things that you'd like to see specifically that you're not happy with right now? I'll just say that, you know, it was in 1980 when I heard from so many women saying, but what about us? And here we are 40 years later, and we really are still asking that exact same question. There are those of us who, um, you know, make incomes uh, that are substantial or that work for a big company where we get paid leave or that are fortunate enough to live in a state where they've had policy enacted. But for all the rest of those women out there and men, but it's really women out there that are saying, what about us? And to me, I want to see a program enacted that can finally answer that question for all of those people who are just not covered by the system and who have no other recourse. And I also want us to really remember that the statistics that you just quoted about what percentages um, need assistance, that's going to change. Those percentages are going to change with our aging population. There'll be more caregivers. Oh, they're going to be far more let, people let, let, in the caregiving stage. Mr. Chairman, I see my time is running out, so I just will have to cut you off, Ms. Linda, and I'm sorry. Let me just point out that uh, uh, in 1900, Americans, senior citizens, had 60 to 70 possible relatives that could help take care of them in 1900. Today, it's one and a half potential people that could take care of them because more people are living longer, families are smaller, people move away from the area. Uh, so we have a big storm coming in our country when it comes to caregiving as well as these other problems we're facing. Thank I, you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. Let me, I thank the gentleman. Let me also thank our witnesses for their testimony today. I think it was very helpful. Please be advised that members have two weeks to submit written questions to be answered later in writing. Those questions and your answers will be made part of the formal hearing record. And with that, the committee stands adjourned. Good job. Thanks, Kevin.